Hi, I'm AC Sedgwick, fantasy author and host of Fabulous Folklore, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented author. She's a fantasy author. She's also uh, brought in my horizons in the terms of folklore because uh, I never realized I was so interested in it until I started listening to her podcast. We're joined today by the ever-talented Icy Sedgwick. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Doing good, doing good. I asked you on Twitter, because it was my birthday way back in June, you know, what was a birthday folklore? And you, you've you handily delivered in like record time. So I really appreciated you taking the time for to, to do that. But a fantasy author and a folklore podcast is, a, is an interesting combination. Tell us how you got started with everything. Really, it's one of those things where I think the two things actually go together, um, because I've been interested in what would you call it, local legends and ghost stories and local folklore and things since I was about 10. Um, and then when I started writing my own stories, it was kind of natural that they would then um, go down the route of fantasy because I guess that's how all this stuff fits in sort of to one another. Um, and it was really because I did a creative writing course when I was 16 at my, uh, my school because it was like an adult education course, but it was free if you're already a student so I got to do that and then every time the teacher would like set a creative writing prompt or naturally I would do ghost stories or weird things and all all these things that I'd been reading as part of um folklore and so on and then it was only really when folklore Thursday started in like 2015 that I was like oh wow no yeah I am interested in this thing and it has a name um so it all kind of came together eventually I'm curious about this though because there's not much folklore when it comes to here in Canada, as far as I can tell. I mean, obviously, there's uh, the cultures that came before the Native Americans, the um, English, French, etc. But how important is folklore to define a cultural identity? You'd be surprised. I actually asked a question two weeks ago, maybe, uh, on Twitter saying, like, how, how did you get into, uh, into folklore? And a lot of people actually replied to say that they'd been told stories by family members and in some cases that might be adoptive family um it might be um sort of local elders in their community and so on and it seemed like people then went out and started to explore folklore like on their own like of places that they were going to visit and so on and then started to spot similarities between them so i think in some ways folklore is important to or it seems to be important to people's own sense of, of cultural identity, but I think it also has the potential when it's not being misused, which unfortunately it is, to show people how actually you can have like a shared human identity as well, particularly when you look at things like land spirits and the folklore and the legends around them and how they're really, really similar across a lot of places. Um, so you realise that really a lot of identity issues or possibly humans overcomplicate things, I think. <laughs> Maybe traditional proverbs as well. Is there any sayings in, in, of course, where you're from? Speaking of which, where are you from exactly? I'm from the northeast of England. So the, the okay. part of England where I'm from is like, it's had uh, Celtic people living on it. It was then invaded by the Romans and they built Hadrian's Wall, like literally down the road from me. Um, we've had Viking invaders as well. So it, and then we had all the scuffles with the border reavers and so on. So it's been quite a fighty sort of part of, part of the country. Uh, so with all of those those cultures that have uh, either invaded or uh, showed up <laughs> to to your area, though, are there any that stick out to you that have stuck around throughout the centuries? The one that I think's probably had the longest impact is probably the vikings and that's mostly when you look at the dialect that people speak because there's certain words um that we use in my native dialect which is actually called geordie which um i found before when i've been talking to people from scandinavia they've known exactly what i was talking about um 
which is always cool. And um, and it's not something that I think people necessarily think of, like they're expecting like monuments like Hadrian's Wall, which is, you know, um, a fairly <laughs> important and famous one um, and randomly misused in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And it, um, that's nowhere near Nottingham. I uh, don't want to break anyone's heart over that, but it's true. Um, but I think that, yeah, dialect's definitely the thing that for me stands out um, as being where most of the influence kind of lingers and just language in general, obviously from place names and things like that. Is there any any proverbs that you use on a daily basis? Oh, um, I don't know, because I'll, I'll, I'll say something and it'll make total sense to like me and whoever I'm talking to and then I'll talk to someone from outside the area and be like, oh, that, that doesn't make sense. OK, I think the co most common one, uh, which probably will make sense to people, is uh, is that of shy bands getting out. Um, and that just basically means, obviously, um, less forthcoming children, um, you know, don't get as much as the ones who basically ask for what they want. Is there a difference between religion and folklore? Oh, oh, um, I'm I'm going to go out on a limb and say yes. Um, and I think I'm trying to think how to say this so I don't offend anyone. Um, generally so speaking, knows. the way I mean, folklore tends to be sort of the shared traditions, beliefs and practices of a community. Um, I think that's pretty much how Folklore Thursday define it anyway. Um, whereas religions tend to be more codified in terms of what lies within its remit. And it's more something that I don't want to say is imposed from above because that's the wrong word, but it's kind of, it's like a set of, of beliefs or whatever that you come to and that already exist, whereas folklore can spring up from anywhere. People can explore it and take it on and and I think to me religion's just more organized in that regard whereas and obviously this isn't all religions this is just the the, the ones I'm familiar with well one I'm familiar with haven't been brought up um Protestant um whereas I think folklore is a bit more adaptable um and you just need to look at something like the way that the slender man myth took off to show how people can just come up with something that people will follow or um get involved with in some shape or form whereas i think religion because there's a, a stronger set of guidelines as it were um you're less likely to color outside of the lines i guess is where i'm going with that i was curious about that it's it's interesting to to see if there's similarities or you know if there's traditional differences etc so thanks for letting me know i'm curious Let's dive into yourself as a fantasy author. Obviously, you're you're taking your love of folklore and you're taking your your passion for the unknown and you're making it into your novels. T talk about how you got started as as a fantasy author. I'd always, I mean, I'm one of those really irritating writers who be like, "Oh, I've always written," and I hate that answer when I hear it. So I hate giving it, but it's true. I'd basically honed what I was doing through the the concept of Friday Flash, which is where a lot of authors used to come together on a Friday, hence the name, and write a piece of flash um, or like something less than a thousand words on a given subject. And sometimes we didn't have a theme, sometimes we did. And uh, one way or the other, I used to usually get something fantasy in there somehow. And um, I had already had um, a novella published um, sort of prior to my first fantasy one, which was one of those things where, you know, Somebody asked me if I'd write it, so I did. Because um, my life motto is kind of, what's the worst that could happen? And that's going to get me in really bad trouble one of these days. Um, and then, yeah, I was the, the first book I, I wrote, like first fantasy book anyway, because um, I'd, I'd started novels before, but I'd never actually finished one because um, they're a lot harder than, than, than you think to write them. And um, I'd watched The Sorcerer's Apprentice with Nicolas Cage, and I'm like, please don't judge me, anyone. And um, and I'd said to my friend, like, oh, wouldn't that be really funny if someone did that with like a necromancer instead of a sorcerer and instead of it being brooms, it being like mummies or something. Um, and then thus I was like, oh, I know, I'll, I'll, I'll just write that then. And that was kind of where the necromancer's apprentice came from. Um, and then it turned out there was a lot more of that story that I actually wanted to tell. Um, so it kind of then led to a series and... This is where I really envy authors where they plan what they're going to work on and there's a strategy and stuff. And I'm just like, mm, 
<laughs> whatever catches my attention at the time. <laughs> uh, are, are you into D and D then? Well, um, I'm going to say. Well, I've only just started playing it because a friend of mine in uh, in London invited me to join the game. So I've only done like two games so far and I have no idea what's going on. But are you enjoying it? Yeah, I think it's weird because the campaign that she's running is very much kind of, it's basically like, it feels like a murder mystery, but with fantasy mm. elements. And I'm all about that. Um, and if, I think if somebody <laughs> told me that's how you could play it sooner, I might have gotten into it sooner. Because I think I was always put off. It seemed like a really, like, a, I don't know, like an 80s thing, which is where it's quite funny when it then pops up in Stranger Things. Um, and I guess it I didn't know anyone who played it, so um, until now. What type of character did you create? Uh, mine's a tiefling sorcerer slash bard. <laughs> so essentially the closest I could get to me in, <laughs> in D&D form. Looking at your character that you've created, what did you draw from to create your main character? Let's say about this particular necromancer. I mean, The Apprentice is oh, I said, kind of a combination of, and this is going to sound like a really weird comparison, but Anakin Skywalker in the prequels, when he constantly feels like he's being held back and like someone's withholding extra information from him. Um, and I think that was kind of added to my own frustration at being restricted to learning at a particular pace at school. Um, and then combined with my own tendency to sort of like try and race on ahead. Um, so, yeah, that, that's probably more uh, more revelation about myself than I necessarily would have uh, would have said otherwise. Um, and then I don't know, I suppose the necromancer herself, because obviously I wanted to write a female it always struck me that the necromancer in that book would be female. I don't know why. And I think it's just because, you know, years of of grown up reading fantasy novels where, you know, you can always think of male characters or, you know, the things like Lord of the Rings obviously is a, is a big example. The female characters don't really have a huge amount to do. Um, that just never really sat well with me. So I suppose it was a combination of... Um, of sort of grown up on a diet of films like um, Star Wars, where at least Leia is blatantly the coolest one in it, um, or indeed the Terminator films, and you've got someone like Sarah Connor kind of combining that with fantasy and then going, well, yes, we shall have um, a strong female character who knows what she's doing. And if everyone just listened to her, none of the rest of it would happen. I think personally it's difficult for a lot of authors to to lead with a female character only because they're usually male written unfortunately and male centric and it's it's a shame that more people aren't saying hey look here's a female lead here's a non-binary lead here's someone else other than what you're used to and i think media nowadays are finally finally getting to the stage that hey we can cast someone other than this person that you've seen in a million films so it's it's great that you know times are changing yeah and i think it always bothers me i remember somebody saying when doctor who which i'm not really interested in but when geordie whitaker got cast i remember somebody losing his mind on twitter because obviously that's what twitter's for um like oh who will my son have as a role model now and it was like a you um and b why does doctor who have to be male just to be a role model surely it's the behavior and the characteristics that should be a role model not what gender they are it so I, and i sort of feel like that you know the, the the diversity that we're getting in characters now is fantastic because then you can look at that person um demonstrates innovation that person demonstrates empathy that person demonstrates uh ruthlessness or what whatever it might be um so you can have like a shared human connection, which to me is is, is important. But then obviously I do recognise it is it it is important to see yourself reflected in this um, in this sort of huge amount of pop culture. So I I think it's great that we're getting all this diversity and that we're we've got a greater reflection of of the human experience as well. Um, and I I think. The people who sort of sit there going, oh, no, you can't cast 
um, this person because in the book they're like this and it's just like and <laughs> you know I don't think it really like in a lot of cases you're like oh you don't want a particular character to play say an elf well which kind of elves are we talking about are we talking about the ones that the Anglo-Saxons believed in are we talking about Tolkien's elves and it's kind of I, I sort of think people get a bit a bit silly about that it's like just you know and enjoy the thing and, and 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 be done with it as a writer uh you obviously have written a lot but you must have a lot of unpublished or maybe hash, half finished scripts how many of those do you have oh uh, <laughs> that is a question um oh i don't i don't even want to think uh how many there are what I've tend to have as well, it's not so much half finished things. It's just snippets where I've gone, oh, that would be a good idea. I'll write that down and then I'll never go back to it. And then sometimes I look at them and go, yeah, that was a good idea. I've no idea what I meant or I've no idea where I'll take that. So I tend to hang on to them purely because like, I'm a big believer in recycling in all its forms. And um, there was one story in particular. I could not make it work. It just would, it was refusing to work couldn't couldn't take it where I wanted it to go and then uh, for Christmas this particular yeah I wanted to write a ghost story but I'm trying to remember if I wanted to do it from the the perspective of the um the gunslinger in my first book and all of a sudden this idea I'd not been able to make work popped into my head and I thought oh, that would work really well in there um, and it then became the ghost story that he tells um, to sort of his sidekick um, one Christmas. So it, the, the idea in and of itself didn't really work without some kind of framing narrative. And then when, once I found the framing narrative, then obviously it, it works. So I kind of hang on to them just in case they're going to come in helpful sort of later. Um, and then if they don't, well, then I'll invariably see somebody else has made them um, and you know. As an idea I should have done something with. <laughs> does writing actually energize you or does it drain you? I'm going to say something that's probably quite contentious. I actually hate writing, but I love editing. Um, so actually getting what's in my head on a, well, paper, we, we both know I obviously write them digitally. That bit's really hard because it's never in your head the way you imagine it. And to me, it never comes out when I'm typing. But then when I go back through and I edit it, then I can sort of morph it into something else. Um, so I kind of think of it that the editing bit is really where, and I mean, like everybody's first draft's terrible. I, I refuse to believe that anyone's isn't. Um, but I think that, yeah, the, the editing phase, I can sit down and I can edit for hours because you can really get engrossed in what you're doing. You can spot your plot holes um, and you can kind of like tie everything together um, in a much better way. Whereas, yeah, the actual writing part is like nails on a chalkboard. That's interesting. Usually it's the other way around. People hate the editing process and love the writing, but hey, that's great. You're the first person that I've interviewed that has said that. So. <laughs> Nothing different. <laughs> that's okay. That's that's why I love this show. So so many different personalities and different viewpoints. It's what makes me excited after thirteen years of doing this. Have you gone on any uh, literary pilgrimages lately? Well, I haven't really been anywhere <laughs> in, uh, in quite some time. I have. I'm trying to think. I must admit, I always love uh, going to. London I mean I love London anyway I used to live there but I always find that it's it's cool going to places and thinking either writers who used to work in London or have written about London um, and that's quite nice obviously seeing um sort of seeing the locations that are in the books um so I mean I remember when I lived in London when uh China Mieville's Kraken came out being able to actually not that I've followed the plot of the book because that would be weird but um, being able to sort of go, oh, that's from that part of the book, or that's that part of the book. Um, and I think in some ways it kind of makes, it gives the book a bit of a bit of depth, um, just because you can like fangirl about these places when you're actually in them. 
that's something I I regret not being able to do is to, to go visit Europe yet or anything along that line. I, it's something on my list to do in my lifetime. Uh, just to travel Europe would be amazing for me because I love history. I love the fact that there's so much more excitement and and fantasy about a place you've never been. Like you, you can get excited for where you're at or or maybe you go to Germany or something and you see a, a castle for the first time. <laughs> it's not something that that we have around here, unfortunately, but we have flat land. That's about it. Going into yourself as a writer, is there any traps that first time writers just commonly fall into? I would say, because I also, um, I run a writing group um, as if I haven't got enough to do. I think one of the things that, the two things actually that stand out that I always see people doing, and it everybody does it, so I kind of almost feel like it's a rite of passage more than a trap. Um, the first one is um, putting all of your exposition into dialogue um, as a way of kind of getting backstory across, and it's it's almost like that, as you know, Ted, um, sort of speech that characters give, and it's just a weird, weird thing to do. Although when you think about it, people do do it in real life where you will remind someone of something that they've just forgotten um, or you're having to tell someone something because they weren't in the room at the time. Um, so it's it's not completely without precedent. It's just kind of irritating. Um, but short of including flashbacks, how else can you do it? Um, and I think the other thing that I see, and again, I sort of feel like this is necessary, but it's, also kind of unhelpful to see from the outside is that people quite clearly trying to what's the word I'm going to say emulate because it sounds nicer emulate existing writers so you can be kind of like oh we've seen this in so and such's work or so and such does this and or they'll, they'll try and use a particular technique and you'd be like that didn't really work and they'll be like oh so and such does it and you know and you know, I mean, you don't want to literally emulate everyone. Um, so I think it's also kind of you do try on different writing styles and personas. And you do try out new techniques and things because you've discovered them in an author's work that you like. And that's how you then find your own voice. Um, and you sort of after a while, kind of you starts to come out instead. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say they're traps. They're just like try and get through that bit as quickly as possible. And that's one of the reasons why I really don't recommend someone who's written their first book to just throw it straight on Amazon um, without getting it properly edited because that's that's just not the way to do it. Do you think that uh, someone could be a writer if they don't feel emotions? I'm going to go with yes. Because I think I think everyone feels them. I think it's just how people express them or indeed have the language to talk about them that's going to vary from person to person. And this comes back to um, what we're saying before about representation and so on, because I get really frustrated when I read a novel and it has to have a love story element in it because that's not um, necessarily something that everybody's interested in pursuing um it doesn't always need to, i mean i can think of loads of things in my life where me being in or not being in a relationship had anything to do with it so i don't understand um you know why there's always that it's like that's how people use that as a vehicle to describe emotions and i just think that that's um a bit reductivist but then i think it's also the fact that it depends what kind of book you're writing really because obviously some genres rely on emotional experience far more than others um so I think if you were to write a romance novel and you you weren't that confident in writing about how emotions would be felt and expressed and that might be a slightly unusual romance novel I dare say it would just become literary fiction at that point um but then if you're writing say a thriller as long as people are in a situation that's thrilling then I suppose it's it, it's it's less of an issue I, I mean personally I'm saying this as someone who is not hugely emotionally demonstrative 
Um, I have very little interest in the emotional lives of characters. I'm very much interested in um, plot and uh, world building and all that kind of thing well, as a reader. So I sort of think that there's going to be a reader for every writer in, in some shape or form. Good answer. <laughs> haven't really thought about it that way either, so that's really good. As an avid reader that you are, were there any authors that you disliked at first, but they grew up, they grew on you uh, as you got older? I'm trying to think which authors I like now, and then whether I would have liked them a while ago. I think, I think I've found a newfound um, respect, rather, for for certain authors. Because generally speaking, if I don't like an author's first book. Or the first thing I've read by them, I haven't got the the time um, to devote to like trying to like them because that just sort of seems like a bit counterproductive. But then I'm trying to think that because I know there is one, I just can't remember who it is. Because I get this with films where I'll watch a film and I'll be like, oh, that's awful. And then I'll go back and I'll I'll, I'll rewatch it. And um, because of my studies in, in like technical filmmaking, and I'll then be like, oh, wow, this film's got loads going for it that I didn't notice before. As I say, I'm, I'm sure there will be someone, but again, I can't, I can't remember. My head's too full of film at the moment, so I can't really remember. Talk about film. How uh, are you? You're, you must be active in, in the industry or? No, it's because I'm doing a PhD in, in uh, haunted house films. So I'm looking at how filmmakers use set design, cinematography and sound design to actually represent sort of moments of haunting and so on. I rewatched The Sixth Sense the other day. Uh, and I mean, obviously, I remember going to see that uh, when it came out at the cinema, obviously, like when no one knew the twist ending and so on. And I remember enjoying it sort of when I first saw it and thinking, oh, wow, you know, this is this is great. Um and then sorry, I got a hair tickling, that's really annoying. Um, <laughs> um and then I rewatched it, so I've obviously seen it a few times in between, but because I was then watching it from the, the perspective of what was the sound design doing, I was suddenly like, oh wow, this is actually really clever. And a lot of the the, the clues to the, the twist ending are actually like all the way through in the sound design. Um, and I had this, I, I rewatched the, the, the remake because the world needed one of the Amityville Horror. And oh, yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't 100% sold on it the first time I watched it. I mean, I'm biased because Ryan Reynolds, but it, <laughs> I don't know, it, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of the original, um, despite the fact that like I spend the whole time I'm watching it thinking how much James Brolin looks like Christian Bale. And That's true. <laughs> yeah, although I do love the fact that the, the dog survives. Um, I mean, I'll watch Marco Kidder and anything, but it's just the fact that when you look at the difference between the original and the remake, um, and the remake, nearly all of it, like apart from like the really gratuitous, gory scenes, which you don't really need, and like I've got no problem with gore, I just can't see the point in gore when it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, you take those out, and the sound in it is actually really interesting, and it's the way the house almost speaks. Um, and I was kind of like, oh, okay, I've I've possibly judged you too harshly in the past. Are there any other uh, any other films that speak to you like this, or that you re reawakened your journey into these types of films besides Sixth Sense and and Meville? Oh, I'm, I'm, I hate myself for even mentioning it, but the uh, the Paranormal Activity films. Um, oh. Well, the first three, because after that, mm -hmm. it just kind of the same thing again and again and I used those in my cinematography chapter and it was only when I looked at how they used cinematography I was kind of like oh oh now I've actually got oh I'm gonna have to reevaluate these films um and it's it's nice though because when you look at films from that point of view even the most awful awful film and let's be honest there's a lot of awful horror films suddenly becomes a lot more interesting because you can be like yeah the acting was appalling but all oh, those camera angles and um it sort of it gives you like a new a new way to appreciate the films and i actually had an email from um a subscriber the other day who was like oh are you gonna are you gonna like teach how to then use say sound and writing and i suddenly thought oh like camera angles is going to be a difficult one to find a <laughs> an alternative for but I thought, yeah, there's so many aspects of 
of film that equally apply to fiction. And I don't mean screenplays, but I mean that actual sort of, not actual, because that makes it sound like screenplays aren't fiction, but sort of novels and that kind of content um, that I think probably could be explored a little bit better or just a little bit further, perhaps. Language obviously is very important when it comes to being a writer, being a communicator, being a person in general. When was the first time that you realized that language had power? Oh, wow. I suppose, I suppose in a negative, not a negative sense, but in a sense where things can be interpreted to fit pretty much whatever anyone wants would be when I did English literature at school. Um, and there's that that meme going around of like where someone's written about the curtains are blue and the English teacher's like, oh, this means that the author meant blah, blah, blah. And it's like, or it could just be that the curtains are blue. Um, and I think that that was probably when I started realising, oh, wow, yeah, people really do read a lot into stuff that perhaps doesn't need to be overly interpreted. Um, but then at the same time, um, I think it's when you really start to look at things like advertising um, and sort of marketing in general and looking at the way that sort of like certain certain words kind of get certain results or the way that people respond to sort of certain tones of voice or um, whatever. I think that's when you start sort of realising that it can be used for good um, and it can also obviously be used the other way. And I think it's it's quite difficult, I think, when you're, if you're a writer in particular and you're just sort of starting out, particularly when it comes to marketing yourself, um, it can be really easy to fall into the trap of trying to copy what other writers are doing um, and not using the thing that makes you you which is your voice, um, which is why I inwardly groan every time I see, and often outwardly as well, um, whenever I see um, these sort of gurus um, teaching, uh, teaching writers, like, oh, here's my formula and this will send these emails and you can sell however many books you want and rubbish like that. It really annoys me because it's like, well, that person is selling things, but they're not using their own words, they're using yours. Um, and even if they tweak them slightly, it's it, again, it comes back to that lack of a human connection, I suppose. Um, and it and I, I, I kind of feel like the world would be a nicer place in general if it's just a human being as well. Do you believe in writer's block? Oh, absolutely. Um, but not for the same reasons that I think most people kind of ascribe it to. I don't ever think. I mean, I think that you can get blocked because you, your creative wells run dry. But that's not a block. That's just you've run out of resource. Um, and the good news there is you can replenish that again. So I think, you know, if you're feeling like, oh, I haven't got any ideas, that's not really right as block. That's more your cue to take a break and go and do all the things that then give you ideas, whatever that might be. Um, so that's sort of a, a cue to play, as it were. I think. The other type of writer's block for me um, usually happens when I know what I need to write, but I'm just not quite sure how to make it work the way I want it to. Um, so it's not so much writer's block as extreme procrastination. Um, so, for example, in I'm currently writing the third book in the Necromancer series, and I know exactly where or how I want the, the the big, massive climactic scene to work. But I can't quite work out how to get everyone from where they are now to where I need them to be. Um, so I keep finding reasons not to work on it um, because it, I, that, it, 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 it's, a, it's a, a plot point. I can't work out how to get around it. So what I'm probably going to do is what I did last time of skip forward to the bit where I know how it works and then I can work backwards to fill in the gap. Um, and and hopefully it'll be seamless <laughs> when, uh, when I finally finish it. <laughs> Before I get into the last couple of questions, is there anything that I've missed that you'd like to talk about and, and showcase on this interview? 
I think really the thing that um, I hope anyone uh, who watches this takes away from it is um, one of the really cool things about um, folklore, so obviously that was what we opened with, is it can really be a good way to stimulate curiosity um, about where you live, um, about who maybe lived there before you. Um, and I think all of these things kind of help produce like a greater sense of connection either to your area or your community or whatever. And that in and of itself, if you're also a creative, um, can then be um, a really uh, useful source of inspiration. Um, and also, let's be honest, like being a creative, you often feel quite disconnected and isolated from everyone else. So I think cultivating a sense of curiosity for where you are and its history and, and everything like that, what's happened there, who's lived there, um, and obviously sometimes you'll find some really cool stuff, which is just begging to be turned into something. So, and even if you don't, it can be a really nice way to make you feel like you're part of something bigger, which in and of itself then becomes a good motivator when you get stuck on those plot points. So it all eventually comes together and it all starts with that being curious. Everyone has one or two people that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I'm going to say Neil Gaiman. He's not the first um, author that I read, obviously, but it was just when I started reading his short stories, because that was what I—that was how I came to him, really. And I was like, "Oh wow, you totally can write these like weird stories where just like interesting things happen and 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 so on." And then I was like, "Yeah, great! I can put all those ideas I've had down on paper." What makes him so consistent? Neil Gaiman. Yeah, I think he's just generally a legend, to be honest. <laughs> From a professional standpoint, you've written many books, you have a wonderful folklore podcast, and you've been creative for all of your life. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Hmm, that's a difficult question. I'm going to be totally honest. I don't tend to have a yardstick of what would be successful and what's not, because I tend to be driven more by, am I enjoying what I'm doing? If so, then I'll do it. And if not, then i try to avoid doing it so I guess in a way if I'm um, if success is me enjoying what I'm doing then yes would be the answer <laughs> the reverse of success is failure how do you deal with your failures oh I failures I think can actually be your greatest teachers if you never failed at something you would never know what to do differently what to improve so even though you might really absolutely hate the fact that you failed at something it's and you know you I'll have times where like I've, have, I've had feedback on like my PhD chapter or whatever and it's not gone the way that I wanted and then it's just a question of licking my wounds and then just going back and actually addressing the feedback and fixing it so I guess for me failures it, it's a short-term pain but for long-term gain so it's just reminding myself that like I can't I'm, even Mary Poppins is only practically perfect so I can't get everything spot on straight away um and then trying to deal with it from there really and just getting whatever it is sorted the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way whether they want to become an author or a podcast host or whatever they'd like to do creatively how can they inspire the generation that follows them whatever it is that you choose to do be authentic um i think that's that's the biggest thing um, the, the quicker we can move away from people following templates and, you know, copying somebody else's style because it worked for them and everyone actually brings their own voice to the table. Um, that, I think, is the most important thing. So whatever it is that you do, um, make sure that you you are yourself while you're doing it um, and don't chase popularity because that kind of stuff is all based on algorithms anyway. So you might as well just be yourself and at least build up like a readership or a fan base of whatever you want to call it, listeners, whatever it might be, of people who actually get what you're doing and resonate with it. Well, I do hate to say this, Icy, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you for, for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. You've asked some really big questions as well. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I, I hope so. I've been doing this for a while, and and I love to see uh, and hear pe new people's experiences and talents that come on the show. So I'd love to have you back on uh, for another interview in the future, for sure. Maybe talk more about your your books and see how that third book goes for the Necromancer's Apprentice. <laughs> No, no spoilers, right? But before I let you go, where can we find you on social media and where can we support you um, online? Um, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram um, as just IC Sedgwick. I'm on Facebook randomly as miss.ic.sedgwick because Zuckerberg. Um, the, and yeah, they're the main platforms. I've, I haven't got the hang of like TikTok or anything. So yeah, Instagram or Twitter is probably the best place um, to get hold of us. And if anybody uh, wants to support what I'm doing um, financially, because like, let's be honest, you know, like I can't live on fresh air alone. Um, I do have a Patreon account uh, where people can support me and then get bonus content of the podcast, uh, including things like illustrated talks, um, bonus episodes, all that kind of jazz. Um, or I do also have uh, my coffee link where I, I say you can buy me a coffee, but like it's really just keeping us in more books. Um, and that's uh, ko-fi.com forward slash IC Sedgwick. Well, uh, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Of course, you can find this interview and thousands of others that we've had over the past 13 years on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word, too, not the number, two. And of course, you can find this interview on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell, and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. Hey, all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Uh, thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.